count down to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, hey! It is now time for another year of the last comic shop! Where we open the shop up to newbies to help them find their way under the comic book tent. And where we keep the light on for those oldies as well uh, to help them level up by... Talking about comics. Absolutely. I'm the host of the most, Andy Larson, and I'm joined for another fantastic season by a J.A. Scott and Chad Smith, my trusty co-hosts, as we dive into those long boxes and read comic books and talk about them. So hopefully you will too. Yeah. We actually want you to go and read these comic books, or maybe read them beforehand and then come to our show and be like, okay, now I've read this and now I'm going to listen to them talk. Like, regardless, we're all about getting you out to those local comic book shops to read good comics. Well, for the most part. Some of the comics we read are are not so great, but this one I think is going to be a pretty decent one. Uh, You know, it's one that was talked about quite a lot in 2021, so we thought that we would finally cover it here. And that is Tom Taylor's Kal-El Son of Superman? Is that what they call it? Like, is it Son Superman, of Superman? Superman, Son of Kyle. Ah! Yeah. Completely wrong. <laughs> and uh, again, it was, a, it was a series that we were hoping to cover, you know, when it was first coming out. You know, there was uh, a lot of talk about this particular series. But with anything, you need to give some series a little bit of time. A couple issues under their belt. Don't jump on that bandwagon right away. So we finally have the first five issues and an annual. So we're going to be covering those today in hopes that you will go out, you know, again, pick up these comics, plus issue six, which will be coming out this week. But uh, one thing that we also wanted to do on this week's show was talk about other comic books in 2021 that we didn't talk about. We did the rundown last week with all the data, all the stats, all the facts, all the figures of all the books we did cover. But after we were done, we realized, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of stuff that uh, we didn't actually talk about. Yeah. It's a wide comic book tent with a lot of different pockets and, and interesting stuff that's coming out from, you know, not only the big two, but a lot of indies. And so on today's program, we're just going to kind of educate you, kind of like a precursor to our recommendation section that we have later, where we can basically say, hey, what about this series? Did you <laughs> check it out? Because we did. And so I think we'll start off with Chad Smith, who, again, as one of our great comic book aficionados, reads a lot of stuff recommends a lot of stuff and i think it was a little bit hard for him to pinpoint some books that he didn't already talk about right <laughs> initially before we started this i wanted to do like who are your favorite artists or writers of this year so i could talk about people like chris somni again who's just killing it on firepower talk about tom taylor who's nightwing in addition to the book we're reading today the Superboy book is also doing really great but i, I decided to want to go with something we haven't discussed on the show and the book I'm going to talk about was the second volume of a book that I would not recommend for the majority of our audience or any audience, but I would recommend for a very small sliver of people. Uh, and you'll understand in a minute, but it's Howard Chaikin's Hey Kids Comics. Volume two profits and loss came out this year. It was a six issue mini to correspond with 2020's volume one. But this basically tells the history of comics through Howard Chaikin's very unique style. Because he, while being one of the elder statesmen of comics today, uh, also straddles that line where he was an active professional when basically the founders were still fully functional. And so he's been around for all that stuff. Uh, And Hey Kids Comics is essentially a... Romana Clay, where people tell a, a story about realistic events with characters that have invented names. And so basically, he has these characters that are representative of people in the comic book industry. Like there's one that I think is Ramona Freyden, who used to draw things like Aquaman and uh, Metamorpho back for DC. Uh, there's a guy that I thought was Matt Baker, who was an illustrator back in the day. And uh, somebody was a Gil Kane stand-in. But unfortunately, things don't exactly match up because Matt Baker died way earlier 
than he would have uh, lasted for the events that happened in this series. But anyway, this is a really great book if you're into comic book history. If you want to know those scenes behind the scenes, like when I think it was Alex Toto held an editor outside of a window by his ankles and let him dangle there. Uh, that story was in the first volume of Hey Kids Comics. Uh, but you see these stories and then you have to figure out, well, who is this about? What is going on here? And because of Howard Chaikin's style, a lot of his characters, the faces tend to blend together. And the story, he'll bounce back and forth throughout time. So you'll have one character deal with him in the 60s and then deal with him in the, the 40s and the 50s. And the, they don't age that much. And it's hard to tell because a lot of the characters blend together. But if you're into it, if you're part of that small sliver of audience that's into the comic book history, that's excited to see these stories and excited to dig in to how exactly all of your favorite comic book creators were screwed by the people that were in charge of those comic creators, I recommend Hey Kids Comics. I read Hey Kid Comics Volume 1. I didn't get around to Volume 2 here in 2021, so I'll have to definitely really check that out uh, in the upcoming weeks. But yeah. It reminded me a lot of that Bob Dylan song, like Desolation Row, where you rearrange the faces and gave them all another name. And you're just kind of like sitting there thinking like, who is this person? Chad and I were going to make like a whiteboard. Let's put the pin there and draw the line down here and put a picture there and then a line up there and say, like, oh, is this this person? Oh, yeah. Like a crazy person. And the, in the second volume, it dives heavily into EC Comics, which was still like slightly before my time. But it has so many creators, it became such big deals in the industry. There's like 35 characters here, and you, you can't tell who the hell they are. It's fun. So something we didn't talk about in 2021 that seems to be on everybody's top 10 list, and something I wish we would have looked at, and hopefully we can look at in 2022 as we try to go back into DC a bit more, is the other history of the DC universe. Uh, and this sort of spans from the 70s to modern times as told from the vantage point of Black Lightning, Bumblebee, Katana, Rene Montoya, and Thunder. So it's looking at the DC universe from, you know, the vantage of a minority. So and and looking at it a different way, confronting ideas of racism, homophobia, uh, hate with love, and sort of understanding how the events in the history of the DC universe would be seen uh, from their eyes. So it, that's by John Ridley with Giuseppe Carmancoli and Andrea Cucci, Jose Villarubia, and Steve Wan. I agree. Like, I think that is something I, I, I kept on seeing it on the Twitter pages when I would check out other comic book uh, podcasts and things. And a lot of people were talking about this particular series. So like, we only have so many weeks here in the Glass Comic Shop, but maybe we'll get to it in 2022. Maybe we'll put it in our, uh, you know, for, for Black History Month or something like that. Maybe we'll take a look closer at that. I think that would be a good choice. Yeah, uh, it was a, and it was a five-issue run, and it was put out by uh, DC's Black Label. So you know that it, it, it gets all the, all the goodies that come with the Black Label release. Well, I think the last book that uh, – and, and we kind of sort of talked about it uh, for my pick – uh, and, and I recommend it actually on our very first show. So if you go back and you listen to the Vision show, I talked about the Immortal Hulk and about how that was a series that I've been following for years. And in 2021, it finally wrapped up. You've got the issue 50, play this long storyline of play a Hulk that couldn't die, and the Green Door, and that everybody that had the Gamma also couldn't die. And there's a wonderful story with. Uh, a Hulk becoming play the new Galactus eventually, that he will outlast everybody in the Marvel Universe and will be the world destroyer in the end. Um, there's also some interesting stuff with all of his multiple personalities and the fact that maybe Devil Hulk wasn't actually a bad thing and Joe Fixit's there. There's so many ideas that are going on in this particular book that it was one that I really wanted to talk about a lot in 2021, but unfortunately, towards the tail end, it was really marred in some pretty heavy controversy right around issue 50 that came out. But I was so invested in this storyline that I was not going to, I hate to say it, let that get me, get in my way. Like, I, I, I wanted to finish out this story. I wanted to see if the Hulk beat the leader, was able to recapture his essence from the green afterlife or wherever it was. 
the fact that it touched upon all of these wonderful concepts about characters that we've known for years and how monsters are really how you perceive them. There's a great issue where they basically say, like, hey, the Fantastic Four understand the Hulk because, in essence, compared to, like, people like the Avengers or whatever, they're a bunch of freaks. So I think it's a series that now that it's over and now that maybe a little bit of the controversy has died down a little bit, I feel if you didn't get to finish this series or you've never checked out the Immortal Hulk, you definitely owe it to yourself to check out all 50 issues. They've now completely moved on where the Hulk is now a spaceship and like Bruce Banner is like a really mean Captain Kirk kind of guy. Like he's really weird. He has like a robot helmet. It's for, it's like a left turn. I guess that's where you had to go after something like Al Ewing's run. You had to make that complete break and be like, no, nah, we're going in a completely different direction. It's only like two issues in and I'm like, eh. It's Donny Cates and my history with Donny Cates is I, I feel like he's a lunatic, but I think I like that. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Like, there's a part of him that's very reminiscent of the old school stories that, you know, they don't always necessarily even care if they make sense, but they're cool. And it's really neat to see Bruce Banner make his big heel turn. <laughs> no, he's he's going to control the Hulk, but he's a bad guy. So that should be fun. Well, one, one series that you should definitely check out is the series we're going to be covering today. It's Tom Taylor and it's Jonathan Kent, son of Superman. And we'll be right back after these commercial breaks with a review of that series. Has this ever happened to you? You're in bed, drifting off, and suddenly think, Who would win in a tug-of-war match between Superboy and Merlin? Did Marvel ever try to make a long-haul trucker into a superhero? How would it work out if I named my dog after a D-list supervillain? The answers in order are Merlin. Yes. And amazing. I'm Jessica. And I'm Mike. And we host the podcast Ten Cent Takes a show that looks at weird, silly, and cool moments from comics and how they're woven into the larger fabric of history. Moments like the time Superman shilled for Radio Shack. When Archie got tempted by the devil. Oh, and then there was that time that DC Comics gave a superhero AIDS in an effort to be topical. It's always weird around here, but we'd like to think it's also interesting. So come with us and commit random acts of pop culture archaeology, one issue at a time. If you'd like to learn more, Head over to TenCentTakes.com. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our Read Pile Review. Yes, in 2022, you still get these things. So settle in. It's, they're not going anywhere. We're not going to change up the format now. We review comic books every week. That's why it's called a comic review podcast. We've got Superman, Son of kal Is that what it's called? He got it. He got it. Hey, and uh, again, it's the first five issues plus an annual. Issue six is on newsstands starting this week, so make sure that if you, you go to your local comic book shop, you can pick up the next one. Uh, J.A., who was in charge of this comic book production? Okay, so uh, it is written by Tom Taylor. John Timms did most of the artwork, except on issue four, they had a guest artist, Danielle DiNacuolo. Coloring was done by Gabe Eltreb with letters by Dave Sharp, and John Timms did all the covers for the series. The annual had some slightly different, different lineup. Tom Taylor did the script with Steve Pugh and Clayton Henry on art, Romulo Fajardo Jr. and Steve Busalato on colors with Dave Sharp on letters and John Timms again on cover duty. That's Steve Pugh art. It comes back. We did a Superman book in 2021 with Steve Pugh art. We did uh, Superman vs. Imperious Lex show. So if you enjoy Steve Pugh's art, you can go back and listen to the review of that comic book. But in any case, uh, let's get the 10 cent synopsis from Chad Smith. It was his recommendation here in our DC month. He wanted to read this particular series. So what happens in it, Chad? Okay, so this book, I feel like, spins out of the whole plan for DC Comics that originally was called 5G, which then turned into the future state, where they were going to age up their main heroes and move those pieces off the board. And so Batman was supposed to be replaced by another Batman, which happened. 
um, and Superman is going off to space to fight in some other conflict, and they were going to elevate his son, Jonathan Kent, in his stead. And so that's where this book uh, starts, with Jonathan taking over the mantle of Superman. Superman uh, goes to his son and says, hey, or the traditional Clark Kent Superman goes to his son and says, hey, I need to go take care of this. And his son is like, I've been to the future, Dad. I don't know if you're coming back from this. And he's like, oh, I'll come back from this. He's very confident. But uh, from there, it's about Jonathan finding his way and becoming Superman. And even before his dad leaves, Jonathan has the chance to ask his dad some tough questions about, you know, like, why didn't you do certain things? Why were you constantly so reactive instead of proactive when it comes to the ills and issues of the world? And, and his dad is like, well... To be honest, I was an alien. I didn't think it was my place. He's like, but you, you were born here. This is your world. Maybe it is your place. And so Jonathan Kent is now finding his place in this new world throughout the course of the series. And I mean, there's with some nation, Gamora, which I've never heard of before. Is that a thing? Like, I, I don't read a lot of DC, so I'm going to show some of my, you know, ignorance with some of this stuff that, I, you know, I, is that is that a thing? Like, is that a real place? Is it like Genosha of DC or something? It's not one I'm familiar with, but uh, there are tons of fake places in DC. So it's just another DC alternative location where Jonathan Kent uh, through some of his actions gets himself mixed up in some of the politics of uh, Gamora. Yeah. And there's, there's like this bald guy. That's yeah. Like Can we else. talk about that? That bald guy. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be a major antagonist for this new Superman. Why do you also have to make him bald? I mean, it's like, it's like Lex Luthor 2.0. Really? He couldn't have done any other character design? That's like the one major problem I had with this whole thing was it just felt lazy to me. Mm. Okay, he's bald, but he wears like the little things on his ears like he's from Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> it's like a lobot version of Lex Luthor. Come on. Oh, unfortunately, a... we live in a world with Jeff Bezos, which is uh, the lame bot version of Lex Luthor. <laughs> oh. That's terrible. I was going to say, though, that you thought that was the only thing that was kind of lazy in this and kind of convenient. There <laughs> were certain things about this series that I I'm glad that they they did it. And I was excited to read it because I've read Tom Taylor in the past. I read a really great series in Deceased. Chad brought that to me and I didn't really, you know, it was about zombies in the DC Universe. I was like, oh, this is going to be terrible. It had to be a really great. So after that, I was like, okay, Tom Taylor, you've earned a pass. Like, I'm going to read other stuff. With you. And so with this, I was like, okay, this is an important comic book. It's a new Superman. I like the fact that they're moving some of the old characters off, giving some new fresh blood to the DC universe. You know, it's, it's very important because it's giving solid representation to the gay community. And, and, and that's, that's great. Yeah. I didn't mention that in my synopsis. Superman, uh, officially kisses his friend in issue five therefore coming out as gay and that caused quite a quite a to do right but uh, you know from my perspective actually there other than that kiss like nothing really happens like it's not like i there, there, nothing else happens in this and yeah and it like, seemed to me it was like much do about nothing because uh, you, you read the build-up about everything and obviously you know the media got it wrong because everyone assumed it's really it's Superman, the the father, not the son. And then, you know, nuance out the window when any of this stuff happens anyways. But they didn't really address it. It was just sort of like, that's a thing. OK, let's move on. It's part of the story. It wasn't like, uh, you know, you had to go talk to Lois and have this big coming out moment. It's like, we kissed. Boom. Gone. OK, I have to go save uh, somebody. And uh, by the way, I'm not leaving because of the kiss. I'm leaving because somebody's dying. <laughs> <laughs> Here, keep my cake. Exactly. So I mean, so I was excited for all that, and, and, and but, but at the same time, like this was not the best comic book I've read by a long shot. And I think it was because, like to JA's point earlier, there was a lot of stuff that happened in this that was convenient for plot reasons. And the biggest one was like, there's this old notion 
like in professional wrestling, about the old wrestlers putting over the young ones by laying down for them and being like, oh, it's past my time. I'm going to lay down and get pinned so that you can you can carry the company into the fort. And that's kind of what Superman's supposed to do here. Like the original, the Clark Kent, he's supposed to kind of lay down for his son and be like, all right, it's time to pass that mantle on. But like, really? They made him seem like almost like kind of a deadbeat dad in this, right? Like, I I hate to say it, but, like, at the beginning, like, his son's being born. It doesn't seem like he even could be bothered. He's like, oh, I'd rather be going and fighting this alien armada. Later on, he's like, hey, Dad, why don't you do more? And he's like, well, I'm not from here. Sorry. Just like, again, another strike against Clark Kent. Not exactly what you would want from Superman. And then halfway through, he's like, yeah, son, even though you disappeared and I missed a lot of your growing up, I got to leave now. Take care of your mom. I'm going out for a pack of smokes. Like, that's what we got from. And even after Jonathan Kent's like, you're not coming back, Dad. He's like, eh, it's destiny then. Fine. Whatever. I'm out of here. And I get it. They had to move him off the chessboard. But at the same time, wasn't there a little bit of a better way that they could do that, guys? Well, uh, let me jump in here just because I think one of the problems with Jonathan Kent, and it's the character in general, is that DC has, since his uh, introduction, been so keen on pushing him forward at such a rapid pace. So, like, let's very quickly compare him with another character. Let's wind back the clock to 1977, uh, before uh, any of us on this particular show were born, is when this character was conceived. This character then shows up as an infant in 1987. By the time he makes his big debut as a full-fledged 10- or 13-year-old character, it is 2006, and then as of 2019, was still a 13-year-old character. Now... That started in 1977, which was 45 years ago. And now this kid is 13. Compare that to Jonathan Kent, who was born in DC's 2015 Convergence event in between the New 52 and their Rebirth era. By the time Rebirth started in 2016, he was aged up to 10 years old. Then, three years later, uh, he was kidnapped by Ultraman and trapped in a volcano for years and returned back to Earth as a 17-year-old. So in the span of seven years, this kid is now 17 years old. That's Jonathan Kent versus Damian Wayne, who's still 13 years old and at no point has ever been taller than Jonathan Kent. Jonathan Kent has been fast tracked so fast. And so I feel like a lot of the issues that you might have are because of DC's wanting to push this character, maybe even before he's fully ready or fully cooked. Uh, So... With this series, I think, uh, first and foremost, with Tom Taylor, what he's really great at, what he excels at, if you look at books like Deceased or Injustice, he understands how characters work. Like, he gets to the heart of why Batman is such a great character, why Nightwing and Batman, what their relationship should be. And so, in this particular book, he has to use that understanding to justify Superman leaving. And so, think about it, if you were superman's kid wouldn't he seem like a deadbeat dad i mean talk about a guy that's always working like when you have the responsibility of the having to save the entire world day in and day out on your shoulders there's not going to be a whole lot of time to come home and play catch cats in the cradle and all that stuff but no i think taylor does a really great job in this book of making jonathan kent the superman of this generation He's somebody who is going to tackle those bigger issues. In his first issue, whenever he encounters the character whose powers are going haywire, doesn't just run in to punch him and knock him down like happens in so many Superman books, but he stops to figure out what is going on with this character and tries to get the character help, even when that backfires after he turns him into the, the military. And so he's somebody who's trying to go about things a different way. And I think that is one strength of this book, is you have Taylor establishing that this is Superman. He has all the responsibility of Superman, but he's not going to play things the same way that Superman always has. And even the annual, like we talked about how the, uh, the bald villain, Henry Bendix looks like you're like a dollar store version of Lex Luthor 
Well, they have an annual where Jonathan Kent goes up against Lex Luthor. And they contrast Clark Kent going up against Lex Luthor and how Luthor always wants to play games with Clark, whereas Superman, one of his greatest regrets is that he could never get Luthor to work with him. Jonathan Kent is finding a way to even maybe one-up Luthor to the point where maybe he can get some good things out of him. I don't know. I just like the philosophy behind this book. And while I definitely can see what you're saying, Andy, about them burying the Clark Kent Superman a little bit, I think in order to establish that difference and make this character a character that's going to be able to last and thrive in the DC universe, they're going out of their way to make Jonathan Kent different, but in a way that's meaningful, in a way that I think is going to connect more with younger audiences. Yeah, and I think that's the key, that this book is not made for us. It's made for a younger audience that maybe doesn't have, you know, 30 years of reading Superman or, or, or watching the old Superman movies, the real, the good Superman movies <laughs> with Christopher Reeve. This is made for a new audience. And and if you read it from that perspective, I think it, it has a lot to offer. And I have to disagree with you, Andrew, on the opening to the first book where Superman's trying to help fight this in alien invasion and everyone's like no superman you've got someplace better to be but it's an alien invasion it's an attempted alien invasion go you've got something more important to do i love that i loved it so much i read it to april my wife because i just it was like great as a father i was like oh it's got all the feels it's all the feels Aww. and then you know the baby's bored and, and batman's standing there protecting the fortress as like the last gatekeeper, it's like, and Superman's like, "There's an alien invasion." He's like, "There are more important things," and it's an attempted alien invasion. <laughs> I, I, I like, I love that. I thought that was great, and that's one thing that I loved about the writing is the dialogue is so witty and the banter is so great. It's like when John Kent is arrested and put in jail, and he spends like 45 minutes in jail, and his dad comes and gets him. He's like, Dad, I did real hard time. It's like, you were in jail for 45 minutes. Yeah, but it was hard time. Yeah, 45 minutes of hard time. When he's fighting with Lex Luthor at, in the annual, and like the, these robots that Lex Luthor built turn on, on Lex Luthor. So there's Superman and Lex Luthor together trying to fight off these robots, and, and they're like, just want to point out, we are fighting in the same spot against something. We are not teaming up here. Uh, I, I, I understand. I mean, th there are some good moments. Jonathan Kent comes across very likable. Like, he yeah. is a very strong moral character that's got more of like a, hey, looking at tomorrow and, you know, how do we solve these problems? You know, there's these comments in there about people in power that are like, they're either too lazy or they're scared to use their power or they they just don't want to because they're not going to be around for what their power might provide to future generations. Like it doesn't matter to them because they're going to be long dead. I think that he makes that comment to to Lex Luthor about how, you know, Lex is going to figure out a way to survive. He's going to transplant his consciousness or whatever. So, you know, hey, anything you do to help the world today, you're going to reap those benefits tomorrow. You want right. control? Here you go. You're a selfish son of a gun, but for selfish reasons, you should care. <laughs> <laughs> and I liked, I liked, it was nice the way the writers have Clark Kent give John <laughs> Kent the the crystal so that he can go into his uh, Fortress of Solitude and talk to his dad the way that Superman used to be able to talk to Jor-El. That's a nice callback to the original mythology and it allows them to keep Superman around from time to time as a ghost father. I, they, I liked these moments. I didn't think that it was making Superman out to be a deadbeat dad. And I also thought, you know, I like this idea that John Kent is a person of earth and Krypton so that he has more invested and he is now the Superman and, and it, it, it's, the mantle has fallen to him. I liked that Passover. I thought that that worked because of what this comic book is meant to be. It's for a new generation of kids to read about it. I think, you know, I could hand this to Alex and he would really love it. Well, but also I'm going to say this, too. Another thing that it kind of bothered me a little bit was the fact that, like, there were other characters that were brought up in this series that didn't have to be fast-tracked, which is kind of weird. Like, they're like, hey, here's Jonathan Kent talking to Wally West. Guess how long it took Wally West to become the Flash that we know today? Like, decades. 
It wasn't need to be fast tracked. No one contrived things need to be done in order to speed up him. They just took their time with Wally and built him up. Same thing with Damien. Damien's been around forever and he's still 13. So it's like, I don't understand like why, like I get it. I get it that nobody wants to write fiction about a character that's between the ages of nine and say 15. It's like a dead spot. Like you want to write stories about kids, like when they're real little, because you can tell stories about their parents. You can also tell awesome stories about teenagers because they have teenage problems and those are interesting and budding romances and all that. But like anything between again, like six and, and, and 13, like that's like a dead part of storytelling, but it doesn't have to be. And so like, I don't understand why, like, if you're going to do a son of, why not take your time with it? Why, why push it so fast? Why do why, why, why have to do this contrivance, you know? Well, like, in the story's defense, and this is outside of the real world publishing implications, like sometimes in life, things happen fast and you have to rise up to meet those challenges. And I think that's really what's going on here where Superman's like, yeah, I've got this thing I, I need to take care of. And John's like, well, I didn't think it would be so soon. You know, what's the quote where life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Like that's what this is. Like it's now his time to step up. And this is Jonathan Kent figuring out how is he going to step up? And I, I will agree with you on a, a lot of points on this. I do think there are some times in this book where things are just too easy or too quick. Like, I, I think the relationship between John Kent and his boyfriend, Jay, like that just happens way quicker than I would have thought. Like, and that might just be me being blind to. Oh, come on. You went to college. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But I, I didn't see hints of any romantic interest until you know, the big reveal. Yeah. But I don't think it was a big reveal. It was just a kiss. I, it was a way of saying thank you. And we're kind of glossing over that. I thought what was the powerful part in that scene is where Jay says, you don't have to protect me. I'm the one person on earth. You don't have to worry about. Cause I can just phase through everything. It's like, he's the DC answer to Kitty pride. Right. Um, but, but that's but another that, thing I think that's too convenient. Yeah. I could, you could say it's convenient, but I, I like that idea that here's someone who's basically saying, look, I I'm here to protect you. I will help you. You don't have to help me. You have to help the rest of the world, everybody else on it, but not me. Which is, you know, that's an interesting concept. You know, it's not going to stand up. Lex Luthor's going to figure out a way to deface him or turn him into a ghost or, you know, everything they've done to Kitty Pride over the years. But right. I like that idea, you know, because it's sort of the anti Lois Lane, where Lois Lane, when she was first created, was, you know, not a damsel in distress, but Superman was always having to protect her from the nefarious plottings. Well, I think it's time to get to some other reporting in terms of reporting on our ratings for this particular book. So we'll be right back after these commercial breaks with more of The Last Comic Shop, where we'll get to our rating of Superman, Son of Kal-El. Have you ever been reading through a sack of comics and thought, maybe I should see what the Sarkham Asylum game is all about? Or been playing Marvel vs. Capcom and felt like you were at a real disadvantage since you didn't know who half the characters were? Well, Play Comics is the show for you. I'm Chris, and each episode we take a look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. So whether you know the comics and want to know how all these games work, or you know the games and want to find out where all this craziness came from, go check out Play Comics at playcomics.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Get ready for the new sitcom, Forza Crown. Everything was coming up roses for Bradley and Cameron until... I could just lie here with you forever. I think we should see other people. And as if that wasn't tragic enough... The rent has gone up higher than annual passes at Disney World. But they have a plan. Turning this place into a brothel. To get a roommate. And to Allison and Dylan. Like your endless sexual escapades. Whole new meaning to home office. Join these 30-somethings as they face the challenges of balancing careers and dating after 29. Coming soon to a podcatcher near you. One, two, All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it's now time for our rating. Yes, this is also going to continue in 2022, where we will take somebody's creative work and we will assign numerical value, because that makes sense. It's making logic out of chaos. It's, you know, assigning worth to art kind of things that accountants do. And I guess that's what we are. I don't know. We're accounting for how good a comic book is. <laughs> and what's our scale for this week? 
J.A.? Yes, so I'll try to get a scale that we don't have to amortize uh, in our accounting books. Uh, it's Superman, so one out of four speeding bullets. Did we, did we, did we do that one already, or was, or was it leaping buildings? I think it was leaping buildings before. I'm trying to think back to our Superman smashes the clan. I think that was leaping buildings. I don't think we've done speeding bullets. But yeah, we'll go with it for this show. It's a new year, so we can always. All old things will <laughs> new again. All my recommendations are going to repeat. <laughs> More Mark Russell books. Hooray! <laughs> All right. So we'll start off with uh, Chad Smith, because, again, this was his pick for this book. You know, he could have picked from anything with the DC Universe for a DC month, and he picked this. So, Chad, what would you think? First, I need to take a step back and remind you guys about my philosophy between the differences between Marvel and DC where I've always felt that DC tells great standalone stories. They're great for Elseworlds stories. They're great for a story arc here or a story arc there. But I've always said that Marvel comics are the ones that fill up my long boxes. And DC books are the ones that I'll buy and trade paperback because I'm only going to get one or two from a particular run. I feel like this story, it's one for the long boxes. This story that uh, Tom Taylor and John Timms and Stephen Pugh and all the assorted company that come along with this, they are writing a book that month to month is a solid book. I don't think any one issue that I read has blown the, the doors off the hinges. So I don't think this is a four speeding bullet style book. I think it's a solid three, but I think it's good enough that I'm going to keep coming back to this book. I love what they've done. I love the differences in philosophy between the two Supermen. I love the fact that Superman now is a gay teenager. Like, how crazy is that? Could you have imagined that 30 years ago or 20 years ago reading comic books? I think with Taylor's writing and uh, John Tim's art, it's relatable. And you understand it and you understand where they're going. Do they take some shortcuts? Yeah. But is the heart there? I, I believe it is. I think the the motivations are pure and the philosophy is sound and i think it's entertaining and so i I plan on sticking with it for the long haul okay well i'm gonna go next again i'm gonna keep with my curmudgeonly ways in 2022 and mine is probably going to be the lowest rating i'm going to give it a 2.5 uh just simply because again i couldn't get past some of the contrivance and I, i you know you guys did a great job of trying to convince me otherwise that you know they didn't make clark ken out to be some deadbeat dad or oh they did that on purpose or whatever but they still did it they really did i mean it really rubbed me the wrong way when he was like well i'm not from here son sorry i'm just trying to live by you i was just like really that's like one of the most un Superman things to ever say is I'm not from here. So I'm just going to do the, the way I'm and I get it. And maybe it was done on purpose because that's kind of like an old quote unquote mentality. Like that's the status quo mentality. And I'm, and I'm Jonathan Kent. So I'm the new freshness. I'm the new mentality. I'm the future and how I'm going to change things. And maybe, maybe that's what you need or whatever. But it, it still rubbed me the wrong way, the, the way that they, they dealt with Superman in this book. And, and I'm sorry, because I think it could have been done differently. But, you know, it's it's not a Superman book, ultimately, or at least it's not a Clark Kent book. He is not supposed to be the focus of it. So if you focus on just what Jonathan Kent does, he does a lot of great stuff here. He's got a lot of heart. He's got a lot of potential. And uh, I think it's good that... Folks are getting that representation in a very wonderful package, you know, with a character that actually means and matters, you know, not some, you know, D-list jobber, but Superman. You know what I mean? Like that's that name means something. So that's good. I, I think my favorite issue was probably the annual just simply because Lex was a good villain. Lex is always a good villain. And, like, you kind of need a good villain to play off a good hero sometimes. And I didn't really think that any of the villains in the regular series were any good. I thought they were just, like, dime store versions of Lex Corp and, you know, Lex Luthor or whatever. And that's not good for, you know, the start of a, you know, a superhero's run. But, yeah, I think my biggest fear about this entire series is that in 10 years from now, nobody's going to care because DC is going to do what they did with so many other characters. They did try to reboot like 
with all the Tim Drakes and all the Wally Wests and all the Connor Kent, Cassie Sandmark. They're just going to all throw them on the, the junk bin eventually. And they're just going to be like, all right, here's your Clark Kent back. Here's your Bruce Wayne back. Here's your, you know, Hal Jordan, because they're the people that people want to buy books about. And that's sad. And I hope that doesn't happen to a good character like Jonathan Kent, but you never know. That's for the future to decide. It's a 2.5. It's, it's an average opening salvo. And I, I'm hoping the series gets better from here, I guess. I'm going to agree more with Chad than with you. I'm not quite so curmudgeonly, I guess. I'm giving it at a solid three speeding bullets. I had some issues with some of the character design. I did think the the main bad guy, this president of Gamora, was a bit of a dime store version of Lex Luthor. I mean, he even looked like Lex Luthor, but with the robot, robot stuff on his head. So that being said... I like the interplay between John Ken and Clark Kent. I li- yeah, okay, maybe it's contrived a bit that you got to get rid of Superman, but I like sort of the issues that they're starting to bring up and and starting to address that the younger Superman is is you know trying to find an identity for himself. I think it's an important story. It's an important book. I it feels like to Chad's point that it's not just okay it's one trade and then it'll be done that if they can keep the team together this is something that 25 issues in 50 issues in you know you're going to develop a really nice run a really nice story so it'll be interesting to see how that develops especially i'm looking forward to seeing the interplay between not just Jay and John, but John and his mother, Lois, as he grows older and he goes to, you know, through college and, and you know, how people change when they go into their post-adolescence and, you know, really grows into a man. I mean, he's not really a man yet. He's still very much a boy, I think. I cannot get over the fact that Damian Wayne is meant to be 13 because what 13-year-old goes and fights ninjas if he's not, like, doing it through Fortnite? That's the most unrealistic part of this whole book. <laughs> he is Batman's son. It Batman doesn't is matter. the greatest at everything. His son's yes. going to be fighting ninjas <laughs> at 13. Batman was probably fighting th- ninjas at 13. Yeah, you think like, Superman's a deadbeat 13. dad. Wait till you meet Batman. One thing I do like about Batman is that Alfred sends packages of Earl Grey tea to every one of Batman's associates. So should Batman show up at any point, there's always tea to be made that's such a cute i thought that was uh very humorous that's also what i like about it the the writing has those little sort of moments that take you out of the story and make you laugh and and make it relatable and as a start of a series i also like the fact that you don't have to have this massive backlog of dc history to appreciate it that you, you're starting fresh. So this is a, a book I could give my sons who don't read a lot of comics and maybe get them into it. Well, here are some other comic books that you can check out at your local comic book shop with our recommendations. Will these be threes? They're probably fours because we're recommending them for gosh sakes. I mean, we hope that they're good books, I guess. Yeah, and we used to recommend something similar, something recent, and something a bit out of left field. But I'm thinking in 2022, we're just going to recommend three books. They might be similar. They might all be out of left field. They might all be uh, recent. But as Andrew said, they're probably going to be good or we wouldn't be recommending them. Well, why don't you kick us off then, J.A.? What is your particular book that you want to recommend today? So mine is very similar. It is almost the precursor to this. So if you start reading Superman, Son of Kal-El, and you're really interested in Jonathan Kent and where he came from, this is the next book you should probably pick up. It's already been condensed into trades. It's available on Comixology Unlimited. So if you have one of those accounts, you can read it for free. And it is... Volume 1, Son of Superman, and this is from the Superman 2016 to 2018 run by Patrick Gleason and Peter Tomasi. This is telling the story of the Superman from the other universe who came over to our universe after Superman died fighting Doomsday. So he's older and wiser and he comes to help. There you go. Although I think it was New 52 Superman is the one that dies. So yeah, it's, okay. oh, so it's, it's so, so it's, convoluted. Sorry. It, yeah, I, uh, as yeah, okay, one of the Superman dies. I don't know. Maybe it's not the Doom. I thought it was the Doom. I, when I hear Superman dies, I assume it's Doomsday. To me, that's when Superman died. 
No, dark side <laughs> threw him in a pit or something. He turns to ashes. It's all done. <laughs> anyway. It's also, it's sort of telling the rebirth. So you get to see a very young Jonathan Kent. So he's a, he's a boy learning to deal and live with his powers. Like it, there's a, a very sort of shockingly brutal scene, actually, where a hawk comes and picks up his kitten. <laughs> And he goes, no, and he shoots his heat rays to try to blast the hawk out of the sky. And, you know, he has no control and he obliterates the family cat. And all that's left is the collar bells. Um, So it's sort of showing, you know, how will this Superman harness his emerging powers and, you know, fight off evil. And so it's it's a very good precursor to the book we just read today. Yeah, and, and plus uh, Superman gets a dad beard in that. Like, but yeah, like, yeah, because Elseworld Superman or the other world Superman, I, I, whatever they call him, he's he's in the black Superman suit and he and he's got he's got a very Tony Stark esque beard. <laughs> so I would definitely uh, recommend that book by Tomasi and Gleason. And I remember in particular, there's an issue where Superman takes like Make a Wish kids up to space. It just has, like, the best day. There, there's so many gems like that in that series. And I'm glad you recommended that one because my recommendation is very similar in nature. It ran alongside the Rebirth Superman series, only instead of focusing on the family relationships between Jonathan and his dad, this focuses on the relationship of Jonathan and his peers. It's called Super Sons, and it stars Jonathan Kent, who's 10, and Damian Wayne, who's 13, even though Jonathan Kent is taller. But you want to talk about a back-to-basics, like, you don't need a lot of continuity to read this book. You can hand it to a kid that just is vaguely interested in comics. And it, for me, reading it, it was reminiscent of the old Teen Titans stuff, where you have these fallible heroes that are just learning their way, that are super relatable for kids. And the stories themselves are just fun. It's nothing too heavy. Uh, it's just two kids, you know, learning their way and learning about themselves and learning about each other simultaneously. Tomasi uh, was just such a skilled writer. He's one of those guys that I, I feel like I need to go back and, and check out more of his work just because I did love that Rebirth Superman. I need to read more of that. And I definitely love Super Sons. I recommended this to my own kid. He's got the first two trades right now, and he really enjoyed them, too. There you go. Well, one book that you kind of need to know a lot about comic books in order to enjoy is my recommendation this week. And it's a little bit out of left field because it has absolutely nothing to do with Superman. But it is a DC comic book. And it is based on a series that we already covered on this show in New Gods. Remember those guys? Yeah, we did a whole show on the New Gods. And one of the characters in the New Gods that you were introduced to was Forager. This series, which came out of Young Animals, uh, that's the DC imprint that came out with awesome stuff like Gerald Way's Doom Patrol, and also Cave Carson has a cybernetic eye, and I even think uh, there was a Shade the uh, Changing person, because it wasn't a man, it was a woman at that point. But this series, done by Mike Aldred, who is one of my favorite artists of all time, as well as Lee Aldred and his wife, Laura Aldred, talks about what happened after Forager died. For those people that do pay attention to some DC continuity, Forager, that new god, actually died in an event called Cosmic Odyssey. Uh, there's a great scene where, you know, Orion says, ah, oh, he was just a bug, and Batman's like, his name was Forager! And Forager, like, stops. I, I forget who it was, but some cosmic-level threat. Was it Dark Side? Chad, do you remember off the top of your head? In Cosmic Odyssey, yeah, they were going up against Dark Side. But in any case, the story starts out with like, hey, Forager's supposed to be dead, but he wakes up in some sort of dream world. And it is really just a love letter to not only Jack Kirby's creations with the new gods, but all of the other like DC characters that Jack Kirby created while he was there. Whether it was the Silver Age version of Sandman, which is not the one with the gas mask, nor is it the one with the goth hair. This is the one with like a cape and like a mask and everything. It's, it's kind of weird, but like, yeah, he shows up in this. You've got, you know, Jack Kirby's versions of the losers, like the World War II unit. 
kind of like the Howling Commandos for those people that like Marvel. You've also got Omac that shows up here with his big mohawk. And then you've got the Silver Age Manhunter, which which uh, Jack Kirby worked on. And plus, again, all the rest of the new gods, whether it was Orion, whether it was Light Ray, whether it was La you know, High Father and folks like that. So, but it's just basically an excuse for ever over six issues for Forager to interact with all of the rest of Jack Kirby's crazy creations at DC and kind of, uh, you know, explain who they are and why you should care about them even in a modern setting. So for those folks that want great art, because again, love Mike Aldred. He draws such poppy stuff and it fits with like a Silver Age motif. Uh, you know, it's only six issues long and, and it really will give you a good sampling of all of the wonderful work that Jack the King Kirby did at DC. Is it all basically a redone Madman book again? Just with different characters? <laughs> you know, you don't have to be such a smart ass. <laughs> Some people like Madman. I do, too. At one point, I did. Know. I do like Madman. I just don't like that every other book he's written since then is Madman, just with different characters. Mm. Not a big fan of their turn on Silver Surfer. We'll admit that. Have not recommended that in the past. <laughs> oh, you really don't like that. The art was good in that. I still stand behind the art. Oh, was yeah. good in that. that there issue was like, 11? That Mobius strip issue? Yeah, that was great. That, that was wonderful, and that was all that was all art. That didn't have anything to do with Dan Slott's writing. I get you that okay. Dan Slott can he can be a curmudgeon sometimes <laughs> with the way he okay. treats. Okay, okay, so yes, okay. So yeah, well, you should the check Dan Slott writing and not the Mike Allred art that I. There I you did. go. But yeah. I I love I throw them all in the same bucket now. They are dead to me. Mm. I may not agree, but I respect that, sir. I respect that. <laughs> Well, one thing we hope is not dead to you is The Last Comic Shop and coming back for our podcast next week. We will be doing another 51 books over the course of 2022. So you got to make sure that you come back. And you can do that by rate reviewing and subscribing out at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. It's a terrific place where you can find all of those links to all those terrific places where you can find our podcast every single week. I'm not going to list them all here, but we're on everything, including YouTube. And if you're so inclined, make sure that you leave us a five-star review to kick off the new year right. Again, not so much for us, but for the other folks that want to try to find our show. It makes it more visible for those people that are searching for podcasts dealing with comic books. More reviews we have, easier it is for Apple Podcasts to list it on the top 20 or whatever it is. Okay. You can find us on social media if you want to continue the conversation. If you want to vote on our Wednesday polls or check out our daily comic book factoids uh, on the Twitter and Instagram at the last comic shop. Also, if you want some sweet merchandise, we've got a, a link to our store on our website. Uh, we have occasional specials on different T-shirts we put out throughout the year. So uh, get yourself a coffee mug, a tote bag and, you know, occasionally chainmail armor. Apparently. You never know. <laughs> and while we may be the last comic shop podcast, uh, there's still plenty of shops out there. You can find a shop at, with using the comic shop locator at www.comicshoplocator.com where you might stroll in and find some Superman books. Maybe you want Superman Son of Kal-El, which we talked about today. Maybe you want Superman from the Rebirth, where it's Super Dad. Or maybe you want Super Sons. Or maybe you just want bugs. They've got bugs, too. Uh, check all that out more at your local comic shop. All right. Well, until next week, I was the host with the most, Andy Larson. I was joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott. Till then, stay safe, stay sheltered, and remember, what do you get when you cross the Man of Steel with hot beef broth? You get Superman. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. oh. That is the dad jokes. <laughs> Superman, maybe some oh, carrots. Uh, Isn't that so? That's horrible. I'll, I'll be here all this year. Super. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>